A very warm welcome to our weekly news magazine program, Bhutan This Week. I'm Sherab Songmo, our top stories this week. The opposition party says that Finance Ministry's notification on the sales tag in rural areas is in contradiction to what the National Assembly decided. Majority of the South member countries have agreed to scale down the tariff barrier on import and export of goods. And the president of Bhutan National Legal Institute arrived in the country today after a five-day visit to Thailand. On July 16, the Finance Ministry issued a notification informing the people about the revised sales tax, custom duty and green tax. The notification states that sales tax for utility vehicles used in rural areas is increased from 20% to between 45-50%. to 50%. It also states that there is no change in other taxes. Utility vehicles, according to the notification, means any Indian-made pickup type vehicles, light truck with an open and tail board, such as Mahindra. Bolero. Meanwhile, the opposition leader, Dr. Pema Jamso, said that Finance Ministry's notification is in contradiction to what the National Assembly decided. Thus, he was speaking to our producer, Sonam Ugin, during the Nangitam program. the <laughs> The <laughs> The the 8th Ministerial Meeting of the South Asian Free Trade Area, SAFTA, was held in the capital. The opening ceremony was graced by Prime Minister Sring Topke. During the opening ceremony, Prime Minister Sring Topke said the region has progressed a lot over the years in terms of trade. Prime Minister, however, said that more has to be done to realize the region's untapped trade potential. More has to be done to realize our region's untapped trade and development potential. A successful and well-integrated South Asia will allow for better exploitation of economies of scale by promoting not only trade, but also investments. Investments in many of our countries are hampered by the small domestic market size. But with an integrated South Asia, investments can increase because the associated fixed costs are spread over a larger market size, which raises productivity and output. Therefore, creating not only a free trade zone, but also creating an enabling investment climate to harness the benefits of regional economic integration is of paramount importance. The Economic Affairs Minister, Norbonchu, said SAFTA is one of the most significant achievements of SARC, which was launched in 2006. Lempo said reducing tariff and non-tariff barriers and reducing the sensitive list of goods can make trade easier in the region. SARC has achieved tremendously in terms of reduction, uh, reduction in the tariff barriers and therefore now the focus should shift to non-tariff barriers. And of course, non-tariff barriers is a little more tricky, a little more challenging, but we cannot shy away from this challenge. The meeting was attended by the Ministers of Commerce and Trade of the SARC regions. Sherab Zangmo for BBS News.
Majority of the South member countries have agreed to scale down the tariff barrier on import and export of goods. This is one of the major outcomes of the South Term Ministerial Council, which ended in the capital. In the earlier SAFTA meeting, India reduced its sensitive list of goods to almost zero to the least developed countries. Similarly, in today's meeting, Pakistan offered to reduce the sensitive list to about zero for the LDCs as well. The Economic Affairs Minister, Nawaz said, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh are also studying how they can follow soon. The member countries also agreed to continue working on reducing the non-tariff barriers. Besides, the Ministerial Council meeting also passed several other endorsements which will put forth in the upcoming SAC summit in Nepal. These are on currency swap arrangement, establishment of SAC Development Bank and improving interconnectivity. Important uh, recommendation that had been endorsed by the ministers is related to the currency swap uh, arrangement so that uh, member countries are facilitated to use their own currencies when they trade with other neighboring countries in the in the region and that would put a lot of uh, uh, that would address a lot of pressure that uh, each country is experiencing on convertible uh, need for the convertible currency so that would be an important uh, arrangement as well Nempo said if the endorsement comes through it will benefit Bhutan uh, it's a landlocked country and uh, therefore the major cost on our goods and uh, services are due to the fact that uh, our connectivity within the country and connectivity with the markets outside, outside of Bhutan, that is a major uh, block. So therefore, when we, when we have this instrument to facilitate interconnectivity between various countries, that would be of tremendous support to Bhutan. Nimpo added, with the establishment of SAG Development Bank, it is expected to enhance and speed up the developmental activities that are in the 11th five-year plan. Pemasuki for BBS News. The President of Bhutan National Legal Institute, Her Royal Highness Princess Sonam Dichan Wangchuk, has arrived in the kingdom after a five-day visit to Thai capital Bangkok. While in Thailand, Her Royal Highness was conferred an honorary membership of Thai Bar Association. She is the eighth and the first recipient of the honorary membership outside of the Thai royal family. The Thai Bar Association makes this presentation after 17 years since it was last presented to Her Royal Highness Princess Bajra Kitiaba in 1997. The list of eight recipients includes His Majesty the King Mongkut, His Majesty the King Bumibol Adulyadish, and five other royal family members of Thailand. During the five-day visit to Thailand, upon the invitation of the President of Supreme Court of Thailand, Justice Derek Ika Ninanda, Her Royal Highness Princess Sonam Dishanongchuk, met with Her Royal Highness Princess Bajra Kitiaba. Her Royal Highness also visited the Supreme Court of Thailand and met with the judicial officials. Her Royal Highness also met with the Secretary General and other officials of the Judicial Training Institute of Thailand. During the meeting, Her Royal Highness was honoured with the badge of qualification by the Institute. A memorandum of understanding was also signed between the Director of Bhutan National Legal Institute, Pema Wangchuk, and the Secretary General of the Supreme Court of Thailand to strengthen institutional linkages and foster greater professional cooperation between the judiciary of the two countries. Kampal Fotawa, Sherab Sangmo for BBS News. People living in the National Housing Development Colony in Samrup Chonkar has and continues to face problems from the poorly maintained units. And with the onset of monsoon, the problems have worsened. Cracks have developed on the exterior walls of this two-story building at the National Housing Development Colony. Inside, it's even worse. People living in the top floors have tried to save themselves from the rain seepage using plastic sheets, but it hasn't helped much. Tenants fear the structures may collapse. 
The colony is old and needs to be maintained. Rainwater drops into the house. Officials say repairs will be done, but nothing has happened so far. Rainwater directly comes into the house as the house is old and we have to stay here only as there is no other choice. It will be helpful if it can be repaired. It has been two years since we notified the concerned officials, but nothing has been done. If we look at the condition of the colony, it is risky. All the walls are old and it needs to be maintained. Officials have been saying they will repair it since 2011, but there has been no action so far. The National Housing Development Corporation in Samrujongkar says that the tender for renovation work have been flooded. The buildings were constructed in 1990. Kampal for Kile Wangchuk, Namge Wangchuk, BBS News. Bars and shops selling alcohol located within 100 meters from schools and other educational institutions across Trongsa will have to be relocated. This was decided by the aid Songkak Tsogdu of Trongsa held on Wednesday. Geok leaders said bars located near the school sell alcohol to students, despite the act being unlawful. Bars remain open all the time. There needs to be a good distance between bars and the schools, Trashang and Gendus, to ensure they are not located too close. <coughs> this prompted the Zonkak Tsogdu to decide that no bars would be allowed within 100 meters from schools and other educational institutions. <laughs> We are not telling them to move out suddenly, and it is not that we haven't warned them. In fact, we have requested them personally many a times not to sell alcohol to students, but they refused to listen, so we are forced to take this decision. While the decision was unanimous, there were concerns as well. Some local leaders said implementing the rule would be challenging. They fear the decision would meet stiff resistance from the bar owners. For instance, in Tashiding, there are cases where shops and bars were run by families for generations. They were set up way before the schools came up. It will be complicated to handle such cases. We have to think about what to do with shops and bars that's been there for a long time. They were set up before the schools came into being. Where are they supposed to go now? The trade officials in Tongsa are, however, apprehensive. The trade rule only says bars cannot be located near educational institutions. It does not specify a distance. For instance, in Trashigang, it is 5 kilometers. Now, if we apply this in Trongsa, the whole town will have to be relocated. The Zonka Tsogdu had also decided that in the town, bars would not be allowed to be located within 50 meters from the Zong. Compiled for Sujaman Thapa, Dishinongmo, BBS News. Kobe Bhutan Friendship Association donated around 580,000 yultram for the reconstruction of Wangdipodong Zong. The cash was handed over to the Home and Cultural Affairs Minister on Sunday in the capital. Kobe is one of the largest cities in Japan. These 12 Japanese are the members of Kobe Bhutan Friendship Association. One of them is the president of the association. He worked as a landscape architect in Bhutan in early 90s under the Japanese Overseas Cooperation Volunteers Program. Reminiscing his visit to Wangdipodrang Zong during his stay in Bhutan, he shared he was as disheartened as the Bhutanese when the historic Zong was engulfed into flames in 2012. So he felt donating funds from the Kobe Bhutan Friendship Association would be of help. When I uh, watched the TV, Japanese TV uh, 24 June uh, 2012, uh, you said uh, the uh, Bhutanese uh, Wondi Hodan Zone was burned. I couldn't understand what was happened. 
So uh, Wondi Hodan zone is a very uh, beautiful and a very old zone, I know. Uh, it, this, this was a, a treasure of not only Bhutan, in the world. Uh, so our association would like to uh, contribute, assist for a reconstruction project. Kobe Bhutan Friendship Association was founded in 1981 by the Japanese residing in Kobe City and some Bhutanese tour operators. Since then, the association has donated 12 firefighting engines and provided sewing machines to NGOs. Apart from this, the association has donated funds for Parutaksang Monastery Reconstruction and also to Bhutan Health Trust Fund, professional development of artisans and school equipment for visually impaired schools in the country were also helped by the association. Bimal Hadin, BBS News. The Labor and Human Resources Ministry says complaints related to overtime payment has reduced drastically over the years. From about 120 complaints received in the year a few years ago, the ministry today sees only about 30 cases in the year. The drop in the complaint is being attributed to Bhutanese workers becoming increasingly aware of their rights. 25-year-old Cheng Pemu, a private employee, begins her day at 9 like everyone else. Over nine sixteenth in Balama, but the overtime will be up to Milate. Overtime build up on the beaming and the overtime beaming June Bala. They per our low twenty five June. According to the eleventh National Labor Force Survey, more than fifty percent of employed Bhutanese work overtime. Overtime is a common practice in private and corporate firms, with anyone irrespective of the position allowed to work overtime. In the civil service, however, not everyone is allowed. It's only the employees who are at a supervisory level or below. In terms of overtime payment, it depends on one's salary. Now the payment is, I think, uh, almost like everywhere you go, it would be the same. La, that the uh, rate per hour is being divided. La. Suppose say, like, if you uh, get around uh, 100 per day, and that would be divided into, uh, by no, the num maximum number of work working hours. La. So that is eight, and then it comes to around certain fractions, so let's say like 12 point something. La. And then if you happen to do overtime, so your normal uh, overtime rate would be your normal working hours rate. La. This is if an employee works overtime from 5 or 6 till 10 p.m. However, if the employee works overtime between 10 p.m. to 8 a.m., he or she is entitled to a payment of 50% more. There is also a limit to the number of overtime hours. The Labor and Employment Act 2007 states an employee can undertake a maximum of 12 hours of overtime in a week. The Labor Ministry monitors if the Act is followed and also whether the overtime payments are made in time and according to the Act. The recording part is always good, but in practical, the Employers are clever, uh, I should not be saying clever enough, but uh, they follow the rule and they give the certain uh, uh, what are entitled to the employees. Let's say, like for, uh, I have mentioned earlier that they are entitled to maximum of 12 hours in a week. So in the record, they maintain 12 hours. But in practical, the employees have been working more than that. La. And the uh, complaints or the disagreements come when they calculate the overtime payments. La. So employees, they will go by the record and then the employees, they say that we have worked more than this. The Labor Ministry says disputes related to overtime payment are usually solved by the employers and employees reaching a consensus. The Labor Ministry says the number of overtime related complaints have gone down significantly in the recent years. The Ministry used to receive more than 100 complaints in a year before the enactment of the Labor and Employment Act 2007. Today, the figure has dropped to about 30 a year. Tsing Pemu works for more than 48 hours in a week, but she does not mind the long working hours. Tsing is just happy she's employed. With additional input from Ugin Sampo, Sonam Chodin, BBS News. The Road Safety and Transport Authority said it is not compulsory for taxi drivers to buy an electric car. The confusion was created among the taxi drivers after there were reports that the electric vehicles are to be supplied to the government and the taxi fleets in the country. Taxi drivers became even more skeptic after Road Safety and Transport Authority started verifying taxi registration certificates and driving licenses. 
The Road Safety and Transport Authority in Thimpu has been verifying documents since early this month. And the Road Safety and Transport Authority explains. He also said the verification process is only to know the exact figure of taxes plying on the road throughout the country. The verification process which began early this month will end on 31st of this month. Ishing it up, BBS News. A team from the Department of Geology and Mines are investigating quarries in Gidafu in Thimpu after the people living nearby complained of an unusually loud explosion that was carried out a week ago. Residents allege that the explosion has caused cracks to the walls of their homes. Cracks such as this dot the walls of several houses in Gidafu in Thimpu. Residents say it was caused by the powerful explosion carried out at one of the mines in Gidafu on 12th of this month. Residents say the sound of the explosion, which happened around noon that day, was deafening and that its force shook their homes causing the walls to crack. Residents say it, at first they mistook it for an earthquake and ran for their lives. It was only minutes later that they learned the tremor was caused by a blasting at a mine in Gidafu, about a kilometer away. A team from the Department of Geology and Mines are investigating the matter following complaints from some of the affected households. The number of blast holes drilled charges were quite normal than what was done before. I don't know why the effect was quite uh, high on that day. Uh, maybe because of the location of the blast site. It was on, uh, on, a, on a ridge, ridge facing the Gidakomi area. And uh, on that day it was cloudy. So because of all that, maybe yeah, the, the air blast might have been felt. felt. Ground vibration is not possible, it's quite far now. But still we can do tests. 
the team will investigate and establish whether the cracks were indeed caused by the explosion. It is expected to submit its findings to Economic Affairs Ministry by the end of this week. There are two marble mines and two stone quarries in Gidafu. Namgi Wangchuk, VBS News. Well, that is all we have for you this week. Join us again next week for yet another edition of Bhutan This Week. Until then, this is Sharab Sangmo saying goodbye.